Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Today, I have a really special guest with me today, and his podcast, The Eden Project, which he is going to be telling us all about, and his books and his studies have been life-changing for me, have been a complete breath of fresh air. Please welcome Bruce C.E. Fleming to the podcast, and I will let him jump in because he does such a fantastic job of telling his story and telling his message that we all need to hear. Welcome, Bruce. Oh, good. Thank you, Gloria. I appreciate that. Um, you've asked me to talk about two basic ideas. We're going to talk about first about Genesis and the Garden of Eden, and then we're going to go to Ephesians. And um, in my podcast, the Eden podcast, uh, we've been going through in season one through what happened in the Garden of Eden. My wife did her doctoral dissertation on the Garden of Eden on Genesis two and three when we were missionaries and we were heading out to Africa to teach in a, in a graduate seminary for all of French speaking Africa. And the, the leaders of the African denominations screened us and uh, checked us out pretty closely. And they said, well, you gotta have a doctorate, you know, to teach at the master's level. And we said, yes. And they said, well, you're, you're doing, you're going to be doing that research. We said, yes, in French, but yes. And so we had to spend two years in France to bone up on our French. And then they said, well, don't do it on some, don't write your dissertation on some obscure passage in the Bible that really won't do us much good. Do it on something that interests us. We said, okay. <laughs> so then we wondered what that would be and they didn't tell us. So after some thought and reflection, Joy said, well, okay, let's, I'm going to work on Genesis 2 and 3, the Garden of Eden, because that talks about who is God, who, or, who is mankind, what is marriage, uh, what, what is temptation, what is the fall, what, you know, all of that kind of thing. Very, very wow. important. And so mm -hmm. she did that. And, um, and then I was working on a different topic. We got to Africa, and uh, after about six months, somebody broke into our house and stole all of my research notes. And no so way. my topic, what I was gonna write on, I couldn't go back to, to France because we, we were there. We were, you know, a little plane had dropped us off in the middle of the jungle. I couldn't go back and ask my professors. And so um, basically uh, it was like a death in the family for us, you know, I lost my dissertation. And then uh, some friends who were present at the birth of our baby who was born out there in the jungle hospital in Zaire uh, said, uh, they were both Harvard med school grads. They said, well, isn't there anything you did at the same academic level? And I said, well, yeah, when we were in France, there were graduate uh, university, uh, university students, and uh, we had a Bible study. We had 30 of them, and half of them had their Greek New Testaments. It was really an interesting thing. It was good for us. And um, so I did go through the parallel passages. If you get part of the Garden of Eden wrong, it influences some main texts in the New Testament. And so I ended up doing my dissertation on those passages. So that's what we did. We ended up with the seven basic passages on women and men uh, that are influenced if you mess up what God said to Eve in Genesis 3.16. So the ministry I started a couple years ago is called the True 316 Project. And uh, the idea is we want to true up, we want to true the verse, we want to make it correct. And so in her dissertation research, she found that God says to the woman, 11 Hebrew words in Genesis 3.16. And in those 11 Hebrew words, the first four words, he says, now I'm going to do something. I'm going to be an, an, an active agent, and I'm going to be changing some things right now. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do, and I'm going to change a couple of things. And then the rest of the verse, he doesn't talk to her as an agent anymore. He says, now I'm going to tell you what's happened. Since you were attacked at the Garden of Eden tree, and you both ate here's what's happened to you. And so then he explains those things to her. People don't see the distinction, you know, God's gonna take action and then here's the results. And uh, we also don't see in English what those four words are because there is a way in Hebrew that you can take two words and smush them together into one word. And that's okay if it happens. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's called a hendiadus. And uh, if you, you have that, then you can take two things and make it into one. But the more she studied Genesis 3.16, she said, there's there are two things. I mean, there is not one new thing here. There are two different things that God's talking about. And the more she studied it, the more she realized, oh, wait, this part hooks down to something God says to the man next. And that part hooked back to something God already said to the serpent before. No, we have to have these two things. So 
what she found was is that God didn't curse Eve or Adam in the Garden of Eden or limit women in any way. And I said to her, well, this is this influences some passages in the New Testament that I've been thinking about. And she was busy with her dissertation. She's more of a one tracker. And she said, <laughs> uh, uh, that's good. You take care of that. I'm going to I got to do this. So that's how we ended up both up with those two dissertations, the one I didn't plan on doing and, and what I ended up doing. So we, we have a matching pair of research. Now we took all of all of that information that Joy did in her dissertation. You can get it on our website at true316.com or that's 407 pages with all the Hebrew and all that kind of stuff. Or you can get the Book of Eden <laughs> and that's 124 pages. So we put this in, this is episode episodes one through eight of season one of the Eden podcast, plus study guides at the end of each chapter. There's even a picture of the hospital where, uh, oh where, our, daughter, where our daughter was born uh, with the palm trees all around. And you can't see the parrots flying overhead, but I, I in my mind, that's I, awesome. I do too. <laughs> so we now have uh, an adult daughter who was born in Congo and an adult son who was born right after we got back from Central African Republic and they live nearby and we have four grandkids and uh, I'm very proud of our daughter's twins. Oh my goodness. And, and we have the Minnesota twins in several ways up here, not only baseball, but our, our three and a half year old twins. And they're oh, just that blind. is special. And our daughter named them Grace after Joy's mom and Eden after Joy's research. So we have That's Grace awesome. and, and Eden. Yeah. So she she points to the book and she says, there's my name, you know, the book yeah. of Eden. <laughs> so, That's awesome. Yeah. So the, one of the things that really stood out to me when I first came across your podcast is the whole thing of the woman not being cursed and also the terms that you use in where she was attacked. Right. And I would love if you would go into that a little bit more. So in Genesis chapter two, you have things getting better and better. God, there isn't even a garden of Eden. So God creates the man from the dust and then he, then he makes the garden. Then he puts the man in the garden. And things are building up, building up, building up through Genesis chapter two. And then in Genesis chapter three, things are being torn down and you know, we've got problems. And finally there in two, you come into the garden of Eden and three, you get out of the garden of Eden, chased out. So there's, there's that. A lot of people call chapter two creation and chapter three fall. Okay. But that gives me the impression that God didn't do a real good job. He sort of created this man and woman in the garden of Eden. So they were kind of tilting and uh, eventually they were going to fall. And he did a lot better job than that. He, he didn't right. create, we were not created to fall. So what did happen? Well, in Genesis three, one, we have an attack. This, the most glorious of all the angels, sneaky guy gets into the body of a serpent and he starts talking at the tree and uh and he's attacking jesus called him and so in the gospels jesus called him a murderer and a liar mm. so when he came his intent was to murder them to cause them to die and he succeeded and then he came using the tool of lying and he didn't just lie with the words but he lied with the form that he assumed he comes and he takes the, he doesn't, hi, I'm an angel. No, he takes the form of a serpent. And uh, it's one of the, the animals over which uh, Adam and Eve ruled. And so he starts talking. And by the way, every time he uses the word you, it's plural. So in the first five verses of Genesis chapter three, he's talking to them both. And a lot of people say, well, you know, e e uh, Eve fell. No, Eve was attacked partly, right? They were attacked. And so Satan is talking to both Eve and Adam, and he's saying to them, why don't you eat this? Now he does address her first. So the Bible just says, you know, the Satan says to the woman, that's fine. That's, that's what happened. So when they were both attacked, you begin to realize, I didn't think about it that way before. I thought about it as a fall. Okay. Now it's an attack it helps us to focus. Mm -hmm. And then they're both there. That helps us to focus. And then they both, they both have their eyes opened. They both hide. They both make up the first uh, clothes in, mm -hmm. with the fig leaves. So they're both doing this thing. Now they're both there. And then God comes and he calls them both in Hebrew. He says, where are you guys? And then 
the man says, I, 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 I heard you. I was naked. I, so he, what happened to them? It's not like hmm. he's used to being, you know, alone because not too long after he was created, she was created. They had their honeymoon mm -hmm. together in the garden of Eden. What, where's, where's all this personal stuff? Just me. And so the more we look at it, the more we see that the man and the woman both ate, but they had different motivations. She was tricked into it. He wasn't. Well, if he wasn't tricked into it, what was he? Well, he, he was convinced to do it. He was persuaded to do it mm. and he did it himself. So now we've got, Paul makes a big deal of this in the New Testament later on. He talks about being a first degree sinner or a second degree sinner. And this happens mm. also in the Old Testament where you have cities of refuge, where somebody is a murderer, but it's really manslaughter. I didn't do it on purpose, but I did kill somebody. And God says, okay, we've got these six cities of refuge. You go there. But if you were first degree murderer, then you'd have a much more severe immediate punishment. And what we have here is we have Eve is the second degree eater and, and Adam is the first degree eater. He did it on purpose. She did not do it on purpose. He was intentional premeditated eating and, and she wasn't. So now we, we start to see how he acts as a first degree sinner. And then he actually then says, when God says, uh, you know, what did you do? And God, God accuses her of being the temptress and God as being his tempter. And he never even mentions Satan, the serpent. Adam, Adam accused her for being the yep. temptress and then accused God because he gave me the wife. Right. And didn't ever blame the serpent. No, now he, and he doesn't actually say okay. he gave me the wife either. He, he doesn't mess his theology up that bad. He says, the woman whom you gave to be with me. So oh. not the woman you gave me. And people think, oh yeah, I, he gave her. No, he didn't. So who, who gives this woman to be this man's wife? You know? <laughs> that's, 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 that's familiar language, but that's not biblical yeah. language. Okay. So the woman you gave to be with me. So now here's two of okay. us, two adults standing side by side. And so he didn't have that wrong yet. But the woman you, but who, who, who caused, you know, who told you you were naked? Well, see, he could have said, who told me the serpent. So that was the voice I heard, but he doesn't mention the serpent. Why does he hide the serpent? Whose side is he on? And then the, he says, the woman whom you gave to be with me. So he's accusing those two. He doesn't, he doesn't accept the blame himself. He does say, yeah, I ate, but it's mm -hmm. grudging at the end. So then we look at the woman and she says, now somehow at this point, she's been watching this going on. She had been deceived, but now she's figured it out pretty fast. And she says, the serpent deceived me. That's right. So she points out the serpent. She calls him out. She explains what he did. She explained what her heart was. She was deceived. And then she says, and I ate. Now God should have said to her, oh, you're a lousy person. You're a nasty, you tempted the, you, he didn't do any of that. Instead, he took exactly what she said and he turns to the serpent and starts to judge him. He hmm. says, because of this, because of what? Because of her words. So she's got these true words. And so we have the attack. We have two responses. We now have God paying attention. The man responds in a fighting Defensive. way. She mm -hmm. responds by drawing closer to God. He's drawing closer to Satan and the serpent. And now God says to the serpent, because you did this to her, I'm confirming that she is a combatant against you and her offspring will crush your head. Mm -hmm. But it always seemed funny to me that God would give that promise to the serpent. You know, people call that, when I went to seminary, I heard that it's called the Protevangelium, Genesis 3.15, the first announcement of the good news. Okay, he will I've heard you. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, why would he give it to the serpent? I just, I didn't like I didn't. that. But he didn't just give it to the serpent. He first mentions it. He introduces the idea of the gospel, mentions it to the serpent who's going to get crushed. And then he confirms it in the second word of the two words that God says to her in the beginning of 316. He says to her, multiplying, I will multiply your sorrowful toil when you do field work, and I will multiply your conception. Ah, so now he says to her, you're going to have conception. Yeah, you think you're, you're going to keel over. You know, I told you in the day you eat thereof, you will die. Well, I didn't mean 24 hour day. I meant you're, you've already, all of this we now know. She became mortal. She was separated from God. She, you know, all of these terrible things. So they both died uh, when, they, when they sinned. 
But he says, I'm going to multiply. I'm confirming what I said back in Genesis chapter one, when I blessed you both, that I said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. I'm confirming that I'm using that same word, multiply. I'm going to multiply. Surely you're going to have conception. Well, now she hears the rest of the story, the rest of the protevangelium. He hears her child is going to crush your head. She hears, I'm going to confirm that you will have conception of that child who will crush his head. So she's got the, the good news. See, And there's a whole pattern that Joy saw of alternating bad news, good news, bad news, good news through this part of the of Genesis 3. So, and I love that when I listened to your, to your thing and, and, but that whole thing of where the, the pain, the toil was linked to the earth. And you talked about that where the earth was, was cursed. And then, but that it was good news that, no, hang on. You are going to conceive. You are going to have children. It wasn't pain in childbirth. It was it was maybe the struggle of it, but it, that was not the curse. It was the blessing that you are going to be able to still conceive and have this child that is going to eventually crush his head. That's right. Now, and I'm looking, trying to look up here in Genesis, in chapter one of the book of Eden, right? So instead of saying those two things, you're going to experience sorrowful toil when you do field work. We might talk about that a bit more. And also then saying you're going to have conception. They put this together. So let me read this one. The Holman Christian Standard Bible. I will intensify your labor pains. That's at the very end of the nine months. And, and it sounds like a curse. ESV. I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. That sounds like a female only thing he's doing. NASB, surely I will multiply your pain in childbirth. And so as a result of that, we've surveyed people over the years, lots of three different continents. And we've said, how many curses were made in the Garden of Eden? And they'll say, well, there were three, four, maybe there were more, <laughs> and there were only two. So God only cursed the serpent and God only cursed the soil. God didn't curse Eve. God didn't curse Adam. But people think they did. he did. At least he cursed Eve because of what they read in their Bibles. And that's a shame. It is. It's, and that's that's been fascinating because of the fact that it's just been passed down as a truth. And it's just been accepted. But there's also this whole thing of if even just with the pain of childbirth. So that whole thing is psychological too. I'm not saying it's not a hard struggle, but we have been taught over and over and over, this is horrible. This is part of the curse. This is going to be terrible. Psychologically, that affects you. It affects your body. You're expecting pain. You tense up and it becomes more than, this is not a blanket statement, but it can become harder and more painful because of psychologically what you're expecting. And it gets, it's even worse than that, not only for the mother who's giving birth, but the, the people around her. So for example, we heard, we were in a village and uh, we heard that there was a mom giving birth not too far away. And we heard what happened afterwards. And they said, now, if a mother, I, I didn't do this, I haven't had children, but I understand quite often it's the first one takes longer and the other ones come quicker. If, if things work out for you, that's fine. Anyhow, there were a batch of mothers who had many children, and they were the midwives for this one mother in the in this thatched roof home of hers. And they they were mad at her because it had taken 16 hours or so for her to give birth. And so they said, you're withholding this baby from your husband. You are a bad woman. And uh, they took red hot, these little tiny red hot peppers that they grow over there, and they rubbed, they smeared them in her eyes, which is just terrible. Uh, hmm. pain they beat on her belly they did other things just to make her do it faster and probably hindered the childbirth process and they justified it all because you're supposed to have pain in childbirth wow wow and that broke our hearts and we said that we got to get that cleaned up and we have to get that yeah. fixed and so we did teach that in the areas where we could we explained no he doesn't curse the woman and doesn't say now the when God shifts now into part two of Genesis 3, 16, and he begins to instruct her, and Joy calls this line one, lines two, three, and four. When he begins, let me show you here. 
I don't know if you can read that or not. Mm -hmm. I'm going to okay. read it out loud. I will surely multiply your sorrowful toil and your conception. With effort, you will bring forth children. Your okay, desire so let, is to your husband. Okay, okay yeah, go ahead. Let me just say this is part, this is where he's, yeah. he's the acting. He's acting. Okay. Now here he's teaching. Go ahead with that again. With okay. effort. With effort, you will bring forth children. Your desire is to your husband, but he will rule over you. All right. So now he's saying not that you're going to have guaranteed multiplied pain because I just cursed you, but he says with effort, you will bring mm -hmm. forth children. So that word effort is a pun in Hebrew. It sounds like the word for sorrowful toil. Sorrowful toil is itzabon, and effort is etsev, and tree is etz. So okay. they're, ha they're having fun with, with that. The Hebrew does that a lot. So you've got that, but he's not, that word etsev, everybody says, yeah, see, etsev, itzabon, sorrowful, you know, curse. No. If you just look at Etzev through the rest of the Old Testament, it's never used in relation to childbirth. Hmm. So having first started teaching this in Africa, I think of an African illustration. Uh, when it rains, and it does in the, in, the, <laughs> right in the belt around the equator, when it rains, things get muddy, very muddy, very greasy. And when a truck gets caught in the, in the mud, it's caught. And everybody has to get out and get muddy. And then they all have to push it out of the mud and it takes a lot of effort. Painful effort, maybe, a lot of effort mm -hmm. to get that out. So I think of it this way. He says to her, with effort, you will bring forth children. And Joy right away says, oh, look, did you see that? With effort, that's bad news. It is, it's mm -hmm. tough. You will bring forth children. Ah, that's good news. He had said to her before, you, it, it could have been, he uses what's called a, a singular collective noun. So. He tells the serpent, her seed will crush your head. Seed could mm -hmm. be offspring, could be lots of kids, could be one. Then you will have okay. conception. Could be lots of kids, could be just one. But now he mm -hmm. confirms it, children. Ah, that's more than one. So I really am multiplying got and it. you really are going to have, mm -hmm. you are going to fill the earth. So we've got the bad news, good news. So why would she have effort? Well, he, God could have been her, I'm thinking in French, sage femme, uh, her what do you call it when somebody helps you with the baby delivery uh there the... like a midwife or that's like the word. A... Yeah, yeah midwife mm -hmm. or doula whatever so mm -hmm. god could have been her doula and helped her in this wonderful mm -hmm. garden of eden to deliver but now she's going to be outside of eden they're off on their own and in all those new muscles and, and and when she starts experiencing labor pangs for the first time she she could think oh now i'm dying mm -hmm. and he explains to her in a wonderful way no with effort you will bring forth children mm -hmm. so it's very gracious what God's doing here. And yet people take this etsev of line two and they mix it with itzabon of line one. And then they, they restate it two times to get the idea wrong both times. So with, with terrible pain that I'm cursing you and with terrible pain, you're going to give birth. And, and so they reinforce it and they make God stutter. And uh, hmm. so the impression is real strong that God is doing this bad thing to her and God doesn't do a bad thing to the man. He's going to have sweat on his brow. All right. How bad is that? I, you know, uh, not in doesn't comparison. Sound very does, bad to us. No. So therefore a woman must. So who is she? You know, why does she get so, such a bad punishment? And so our professor in, in Strasbourg, France took our class a couple of blocks to the huge 11th century cathedral in, in Strasbourg, France, and these giant portals in the front of the cathedral with the bas relief, the, the, the statues that almost stand out freely from the, the doorway. And he, we've got the, 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 the virgins with the oil and the don't have the oil. But right at the end, here is Eve. She's standing out and she has a piece of fruit in her hand. She's offering and she looks lovely and she's smiling. And then he says, come around and look in the back, look at her back. And in her back, embedded in her shoulders and writhing down her back are stone serpents and then also boils. And he says, this is what the, the sculptor thought theologically of, of Eve, that she was in league with the, with the serpent and that she was wow. inspired by him and that she was full of pus and boils and she's infected physically and all these kind of things. This is a woman. This is the first mother and all mothers are like her. And she was, capital T, the temptress. And she didn't tempt anybody. She didn't even tempt herself. She was deceived into doing it. She was deceived. Yeah. 
And, and so all of this stuff is real. I think people have the wrong, they come with a wrong predisposition when they start reading 316. And so they say, yeah, she was bad. And therefore, yeah, look at this. This must be a bad thing God's doing to her. Well, that's, that's not very good theology. It makes God out to be a monster. Right. And it, and it has often felt like, and I told you before we started recording is like all of this that you're telling me is just such like a fresh breath of air to my soul, because it's like, I never felt that from God. I never felt that, you know, curse or that pushing away from God, but yet you read it and you hear it. And it's like, oh, you're less than man. You're the one who's deceived. So you can't, you know, and then going into that whole thing of where your desire is to your husband and he will rule over you. And, and that has just been like, pushed under. Yeah. It says your desire is to your husband, but he will rule over you. And that has been just like, well, that feels like hopelessness because you're wanting this, but he's just going to rule over you with an kind of, you know, finality. But look what, look at what section those words come in. He's not taking action and, and rearranging things at all. God is simply telling her now after the attack and you guys eating, this is the way things are at this moment. I'm analyzing this for you. And he says, he looks at her heart and he says, well, mm -hmm. I got good news for you. So here's the good part. Your desire is for your husband. You and, you and he were in the Garden of Eden on your honeymoon. And of course, your love, your desire for him. Why do I say love? Well, desire. Joy would say affection. Okay. She's the okay. Old Testament scholar and I have to respect her words. But that same word is used in Song of Solomon, and it describes Solomon's love for his wife. And he says, it, mm. she says, his desire is for me. His desire is this a, a bad craving, you know. I read one commentator who's, that I respected a lot until I read that. And he said, this is, this is a, 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 an unhealthy desire. She is like an, a nymphomaniac with this desire. That's not what it says. It just says her desire, you know, her love is for him. So he's looking at her heart and he says, you know, your desire, now there's no verb in Hebrew. So you put the present tense. Your desire is for your husband. Two Hebrew words. Your desire is for your husband. And then two more words and they're, they're different, but he will rule over you. Maybe that's three, but anyhow, but he will rule over you. God is not talking to the man saying, I want you to rule over her. He's not saying to the man, okay, now I'm putting you in charge. He's warning her that she's married to the most sinful man in the world. And she was, and he's warning her that he's going to try to rule over you. What's the very first thing the man does after God stops judging them in verse 20, he does rule over her. He calls her name whatever the name is. So in Genesis chapter two, when God says, and it's just the man at that point, and God says, you know, you're supposed to rule over all these animals and, and I want you to name them. And he uses what's called in Hebrew, a naming formula. It's sort of like I W Sir Lancelot. So, so yeah, he says, yeah. I W Sir Horse, <laughs> or, or I W Sir Giraffe, or I W Lady uh, Butterfly or whatever. So he, he gives names. He calls them a name. There's a, there's a, some extra words that show you that he's dubbing them with a name. And so the, in Genesis chapter two, he doesn't give the woman a name. He goes, oh, wow, <laughs> here's woman and I'm man and, and we're together. This is great, God. There's no name giving in Genesis two when, when he says, she, you know, this is woman. That's not a name. All right. But in Genesis chapter three, he gives her a name, Eve. He calls her a name. He rules over her and he presumes mm. now he's presuming god ruled over adam god ruled over eve when the serpent says follow my words the man said okay i'm not going to have god rule over me on this i'm going to rule over myself and i'm going to follow that serpent's words so now the man is ruling he presumes to rule over himself and when he gets now after God's done with the judgment, the man says, yeah, and I'm also going to rule over her. So he presumes to, to rule over her, which is a sin. Mm -hmm. And God warned her, he's going to rule over you. And you would expect to see how he does. And sure enough, the very first thing he does is to rule over her. And before anything else bad can be done, God chases them both out of the garden and says, enough of this. 
Mm-hmm. So the, the word itzabon about uh, sorrowful toil, that's used only three times. So it's pretty easy to define in the Bible. And the most clear is Genesis 5, 29, where, where the parents of Noah say, we're going to name this son Noah because we're hoping that he will uh, spare us from the sorrowful toil of our hands when we work this, the ground, which the Lord has cursed because of the man. Now, there's a good definition. What is itzabon? It's working the toil with our hands, the ground that God cursed. Hmm. And so what is it for the man? God says to the man, cursed is the ground because of you. And with it, you're going to have sorrow. You're going to have sorrowful toil and you're going to have sweat and all of that. And so then to the woman, he didn't give her the details, but he just talked to her and she's right there. He just talks to the man and she learns the details when it's appropriate because the curse is because of the man. And they both have, it's a bone. They both have sorrowful toil. That is so fascinating. And it's just been like, it just makes so much sense of where like understanding, like there wasn't a lot stricter punishment for the woman when it was, she was deceived, but the, it, the curse was to the, the serpent and to the ground. Right. So let's go into a little bit again now in Ephesians, taking that, and you had said that the reason you did the whole thing in the New Testament is because if you got it wrong in Genesis, this is going to trickle over to how the New Testament was. And so go into that and kind of give us um, the overview of where you're at with that. So when we get to Ephesians, now this is, uh, so we had eight episodes on the Eden podcast on what happened in Genesis two and three, creation attack. And that's what we turned into the book of Eden. So it's, it's neat. It's an ebook that seems to be the most popular format, but it's also the paperback, which you can use with the study questions. And then it's also on audible. So now we're in season two and we're working, we worked our way through Ephesians and with requests. Now we're going to turn that into a book as well. And we're going to call that beyond Eden, Ephesians 5, 15 to 6, 9. How is it beyond Eden? Well, it's beyond Eden in in the sense that the good relationship that the man and woman had in the garden of Eden with God, they were naked and unashamed. They were naked before each other and they were unashamed before God and before each other. So that great relationship that they had, Paul calls that, he talks about in Ephesians 5, 32, the great mystery. Now, we have to understand what a mystery is in Bible terms. A mystery is something that was previously hidden, but now is revealed. So when he talks about the great mystery, just any mystery is a big deal in in scripture. But when you have the great mystery, it's a big, big deal. And so what he says is, this is the great mystery. This is the great revelation that I have for you. And he says, I'm talking about Christ and the church. Mm -hmm. So there's a big deal relationship between Christ and the church. Well, he just had quoted Genesis 2, 24, the two shall become one flesh. And now he says, Christ and the church. He's talking about the relationship between Christ and the church as if we are married. I don't like to say it that way, but we are one flesh. We're we're in what's called a joint body, hyphenated, a joint body. If you picture an ant, I was reflecting on this when we were in Africa and I was looking down, they have big ants over there. And uh, I, in Africa, they think in a different way than we do in the West, which is philosophical. We think in concepts and abstract ideas, but they think in concrete relational ways. So I'm looking at this ant and I go, look, it has, it has a head. That's not the body. It has the abdomen. That's not the body. It has the thorax. That's not the body. It has three parts that are hooked together. This one joint body makes one body. Hmm. And so I went back, I said, th- I think that's what Paul's talking about here is a joint body, which is, you can't have a head living by itself. You can't have the body living by itself. You got to have them all together and they work together. So I went back earlier in Ephesians and I found where he says, we are co-laborers, we are co- co-inheritors, but he says, we are co-body, we are a joint body. So we Christians, Jews and Gentiles, all of us believers together, we form a joint body. So right there, I'm defining it according to what was said earlier in in Ephesians. So when you get to chapters four, five, and six, that's the second half. That's the practical application part of the book of Ephesians. Chapters one, two, and three, pretty much he's teaching us things. He's resuming, he's going over theology, good, good basic principles. 
chapters four, five, and six, he's telling us, okay, now here's how it applies. And I noticed a pattern when I was reading through it. At the very first beginning of chapter four, he says, therefore walk. And some verses later, he says, therefore walk. Oh, no, don't walk. And then later on, therefore walk. Therefore, therefore don't walk. Therefore walk circumspectly or walk very carefully. And finally in section six, therefore stand in 610. Mm -hmm. So now we have six sections. And if I wanna look at this section in, in, at the end of chapter five, which you're talking about, then I have to respect where is the therefore walk that starts that section and where is the next therefore walk that starts the previous, the next section. So I, I know what the limits are and the therefore walk circumspectly or therefore walk very carefully is in 515. And the next one is until 610. So I've got a unit between 515 and 69. There's a chapter break in the middle. Well, those chapter breaks were added a long time after Paul, uh, centuries later, and those weren't inspired and they made, this one they got in the wrong place. So the, the, the thing really should start with 515 and go to 69. And in it, Paul, now he starts to say, he has a pattern of fours. He says, there's four important things when he starts verses 15, 16, 17, 18. And the fourth thing is the most important thing. And that was be being filled with the spirit. He takes that fourth thing and he gives you four more things that explain how to be being filled with the spirit. So he's got 19A, 19B, 20, 21. 21 is submitting yourselves one to another in Christ. Mm -hmm. And then he takes that fourth thing and he goes into it in the next. And all of the rest of 521 or 22 to 69 explains how we are mutually submitting ourselves, reciprocally submitting ourselves one to another. And in the middle of that, and the main point of that is 532, where he says, I'm talking about the great mystery, Christ in the church. So all of this section from 521 on, Christ is talking about us united with him in one body in the church. Don't look at your chapter headings or your, your paragraph titles that are stuck in your Bible because they <laughs> say this is all about marriage. Marriage. And it's Definitely. not. It's all about the church, us with Christ. We are one joint body in Christ. And now he's going to give us some illustrations and some teaching on how to know that and explain what it is. At the end, he's going to talk about husbands and wives together and then about parents and children and then masters and slaves and how this all fits to show that we're all united we're all brought together but this whole passage is about christ and the church not about marriage primarily it's fascinating so for those of you who have not found the eden podcast you need to go and listen to it and you got to listen to it like two times because there's so much really good information and it's just like soaking it in so i think i'm like on my third time through with all of this but um so this has like really been I think it's like I said before, and I'm going to repeat it, but it's, it's a breath of fresh air. It just, it feels like it resonates with your soul. And it, it just, um, it feels like, oh, it finally makes sense. Like the contradictory passages of how God views us, it, they're not contradictory, but it feels like, oh, God says, I am valuable. I am worthy. He died for me. He loved me and completely, but yet then in the Genesis, oh, the woman was cursed. You know, and there's a, you know, there's a less than theme going throughout the Bible in the way that it has been translated because of the misunderstanding with some of that. So um, I've loved it. I've loved all of that I've learned and I can't wait to like keep following you and learning. So tell our people, tell our readers everywhere they can find you. And then if there's a resource that you feel like would be super valuable to them. Our website is... Uh tru316.com. So when you're talking about feeling good, go to J John 316. That's, you know, for God mm -hmm. so loved the world. That's great. Yeah. And we should be able to feel the same way when we go to Genesis 316. So mm -hmm. we're trying to true up that verse. So it's true316.com. And there we have links to the podcast. We have links to our YouTube channel. We have links to our book. It's all there. There's a blog and, uh, uh, there's a way to join the True 316 project. We're starting to translate it into Chinese, into French, and into other languages. So we'd like to get the word out. So that's the main place to go is tru316.com. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining me today. And um, I can't wait to have conversations with you in the future. Thank you very much.